So today we're going to talk about a topic that can be uh, can be uncomfortable. Um, we're going to talk about the Chicago Bears defense. No, I'm kidding. We're going to talk about uh, diversity, inclusion, and equity. And we're going to talk about how it takes hard work and focus. We're going to talk about how it takes courage. And we're also going to talk about how it's good for business. But I want you to notice the, the little transition here. You know what? This doesn't work unless it starts with the leadership in the organization, because leadership takes hard work and focus. Leadership takes courage and leadership is, is good for business. And again, this can be an uncomfortable topic, but I'm going to approach it from a couple of different ways that hopefully by the end of it, it's going to give you just a little bit of a different perspective on it. And what I'd like you to ask you to do, if I say something that doesn't make sense, or you don't agree with, hold on to that and see if it comes back to uh, making sense by the end of the presentation. If it doesn't, we can, uh, we can talk about it in the breakout sessions. But right now, I'd like you to take a look at this picture. And I'd like you to take note of everything you see in the picture that's blue. Okay. Now I'd like you to write down everything that you saw in that picture that was yellow. So uh, for some people that are wired a certain way, you may be like, wait a minute, you tricked me. You may even find yourself getting angry. You asked us to look for stuff that was blue. Now you want us to write down stuff that's yellow. How is that even possible? Well, guess what? You were we were all looking at the same picture, but our mind chose to focus on what we told it to. We looked at something and we focused on it. And that's really the way our brains work. Um, two people can look at the exact same situation and come away with a completely uh, different interpretation or a different perspective. And, you know, we all have this filter and this lens, and it's based on all of our life experiences up to this point in time. So I'd like you to look at another picture. And I just want you to take note of, I'm not going to trick you with this one, but I want you to take note of, of what you see. Because if you see this picture and all of your life experiences up to this point have informed you that someone that looks like this might be a threat, that could create certain emotions and that could result in certain actions. So I live uh, in the western suburbs. I've lived here for uh, our town in Elmhurst for 25 years. I've been the president of the Rotary Club. I'm on the board of the university. My wife's, the, uh, my wife's on the library board. We know people. But when things started to happen over the summer with the murder of George Floyd, I was talking to my neighbors, and my neighbors were shocked when I told them, hey, look, you know what? I, I don't go for a walk in my own neighborhood without my without my dog. And they're like, why? We don't understand. Well, uh, if you see somebody that looks like that in your neighborhood and you don't know them, you don't know me, what sort of reaction are you going to have? Take note of the next picture, two pictures. Same guy on the left, and it's actually the same guy. This is me when, as my kids say, when I was much younger. Um, but there's another picture. So what sort of reaction do you get when you see the picture on the right? You know, is it baseball, apple pie, uh, all American, make you feeling proud to, to be part of this country. Um, well, guess what? Some people could look at that exact same picture and it could be considered offensive. Maybe we've invaded your country at some point or occupied your country. It's all based on that lens and that filter that we have that, again, goes back to all of those life experiences that we have. If you served in the military, you could look at this picture and see, hey, that guy was an infantry officer. He was a captain, went to ranger school, jumped out of airplane. There's lots of different things you could get. Again, based on your level of consciousness, based on your level of awareness. So a couple of terms I just want to make sure that we're all on the same sheet of music about. And these are this is the way that I look at it. There may be some other ways to do it, but diversity, equity, and inclusion. Diversity is all about differences. Think of that box of crayons with 64 different colors in it and all sorts of different 
different shades of things or think about a board meeting or a manager's meeting, leader's meeting where you're sitting around and does everybody look the same? Did everybody go to the same schools? Does everybody have the same mindset? So diversity is all about uh, looking at it from a whole bunch of different ways and making sure that everybody's not coming at it from the same perspective. Equity, is it a level playing field? Uh, does everyone have equal access to the same opportunities? Does everyone get valued as an equal? And then this idea of inclusion, because inclusion takes hard work. Talk about this a little bit more later, but it's actually easier to exclude than it is to uh, than it is to include. And I'll come back to that again in just a minute. So another term that we should get our arms around is this idea of implicit bias. I don't want to ruin it for anybody, um, but if you've ever taken an implicit bias assessment, at the end of the day, and I have a link on here that you can go to, but at the end of the day, they all pretty much say the same thing. And what they say is that we generally speaking, prefer to be around people that are like us. And that like us is key because it can mean a whole bunch of different things. Does it mean like us in terms of personality, extroverted or introverted? Behavior, somebody that's very people-oriented or CFOs that are very task-oriented. Sorry, I, that's a bias of mine. I just threw it out there. Do you like the Cubs or do you like the Sox? But how is it at the end of the day – we're all Bears fans or Blackhawks fans. We come together on that. Do you prefer beer or wine? It's after five o'clock someplace. And what about politics? We just had an election. I think it's over, um, but we just had an election. You know, that can create a lot of different feelings and emotions. And again, generally, we prefer to be around people that are like us. But what about this issue of race? Why is race such a big deal? And I'm going to take just a few minutes to talk about the history of race in America, but I'm gonna give you some resources down on the bottom of the page. I'm also gonna encourage you to do your own work. Look into this stuff. Don't believe it just because I'm saying it. Dig into this stuff. And the more you do, I think the more that lens, that filter that we have starts to change. So, you know, our country, slaves were from Africa, were first introduced in 1619 uh, because we were an agrarian society. We had, uh, we had a need for labor. At the time it was viewed that slavery was a cheap form of labor. Turned out not to necessarily be that way, but slaves were brought in from Africa to help plant the crops and get the crops out of the field. Slavery is abolished, civil war ends, we go through this uh, period of reconstruction, and you know what, you're a landowner in the South, and you've got crops in the field, uh, but now you don't have a labor force to, uh, to get them out of the field. So what happened was, some of these landowners said, hey, look, we'll build you a town, we'll pay you a salary, we'll build you a house. Now, the amount we're going to pay you is less than we're going to charge you in rent, but it's a pretty good deal. Just stay there. And that was that period of, uh, of reconstruction or maybe even called indentured service. Well, that went on for a period of time until our country started to change a little bit. And these, these, these former slaves in the South decided, you know what, we want a better life. So they left these communities in great numbers and migrated up to the North, great cities like Chicago, Cleveland, Detroit, Cincinnati, because again, we were becoming an industrialized society and some very, very, very affluent Black communities uh, were established. And segregation wasn't really a thing back then. And actually, it wasn't a thing until 1914, um, when President Woodrow Wilson segregated the federal workforce. If you worked in the Department of Treasury, um, if you're a Black person or a white person, you could be working right next to each other. After that executive order was signed, no, these are the jobs for black people. These are the job for white people. And that cascaded into what you may or may not have heard of as Jim Crow laws and black codes. And that was pretty much the law of the land up until 1964. I was born in 1965. So the year before I was born. 
um, Civil Rights Act was enacted, which, uh, which, which changed things. But it's so important to understand that, look, this is where we came from. This is the history. And so I want to introduce you to my dad. My dad is 94 um, years old, lives just outside of Washington, D.C. He uh, is a veteran of three wars. He uh, enlisted Initially, at the beginning of World War II, ended up going to officer candidate school, fought in a segregated unit in the Philippines at the end of World War II, uh, stayed in for a little while, got out, came back in right before the Korean War and fought in a segregated unit in the Korean War. And that meant, hey, if you were a black soldier, you, worked, you were in this unit. If you were a white soldier, you worked in this unit. But if you're a black soldier, the leadership of that unit may have been, uh, may have been white. Uh, stayed in and uh, fought in the Vietnam War, ended up, again, a guy who's from the suburbs of Philadelphia that enlisted in a segregated army, retired as a lieutenant general, uh, three-star general. And um, one of the reasons why I don't live in D.C. is because after, uh, after he got out of the army, he was the director of the Federal Emergency Management Agency. He was the president of Prairie View A&M University. And then he was the CEO of the Washington, D.C. public school system. And those shoes were just way too big for me to fill. So I had to, uh, I had to move to Chicago after I got out of the army. But as I was going through some of his stuff, I found uh, this this army pamphlet. I'm going to apologize in advance because some of the language it may be offensive, but it was written in 1944. And it's called Command of Negro Troops. And oh, by the way, the department, the War Department time tried to get copies of this back. They didn't want it in circulation. But this pamphlet was designed to help white leaders in black units interact with people that were different than them. And so for the time, it was, it was actually very progressive um, because what it looked at is it said that, you know what, be careful about stereotyping people, be careful about putting in a box and making generalizations. And as I'm giving this talk, this is Wes Becton's story. If you found 10 other African-American 55-year-old men, they're going to have different stories as well. But the only way you find that out is if you take the time to ask questions. And again, we'll come back to that um, in just a little bit. You know, one of the other things says, and this is talking about um, access and, and opportunity and giving people the opportunity to work um, to their best of their abilities. You know what? That's that's kind of who we are um, as Americans. But you know what? This took hard work. The military had to put the hard work and the effort into training its leaders how to get along with people that were different than them. Because they knew that if they didn't, the unit would never be able to fight in a cohesive way. And it's interesting when my father served in the Korean War and it was desegregated, it wasn't for social reasons. The reason that President Truman desegregated the military is because we were getting our butts kicked. If you follow the Korean War or student of history, we were pushed all the way back to the Pusan perimeter at the southern edge of the, uh, of the peninsula. And we needed replacements to come in from Hawaii and Fort Lewis, Washington. And we couldn't take the time to separate out whether a black person went here or a white person went there. And you know what they found? They found that when people are cold, tired, miserable, hungry, and afraid, and somebody offers to watch their back and help them, they don't care what color that other person is. They don't care what they look like, where they're from, how much money they have in their bank account. They're just grateful for the help. So diversity, equity, and inclusion leadership takes hard work and focused effort. So this is the idea of being included or excluded. And, you know, at the end of the day, We've probably all felt this one way or another. We've probably all been on a playground when we were younger. 
and maybe we didn't get picked to play a game and we got left out, or maybe there was a party going on and we didn't get invited, or maybe, you know what, uh, you applied for a job and you didn't get it, or you had a job and somebody decided they didn't want you to come to work there anymore. Now you're, now you're excluded. How does that feel? Well, in an organization, in, in a corporation, um, when people feel excluded, they're not engaged. There's a reference that I gave here, which has nothing to do with uh, human resources or, or finance, but it's called Mismatch by Kat Holmes. And what she does is she uses design, um, architecture and design and engineering to show how easy it is to exclude and how hard it is to actually bring more people into the fold. One of the examples she uses is a computer mouse designed for right-handed people. Well, majority of people are right-handed, but if you're left-handed, you were excluded from that. And you know what? You're gonna have to learn how to use it with your right hand. And so this example here is you got these zeros over here in the square and you got these ones over here in the circle. And uh, you know what? At the end of the day, uh, let's say these zeros want to be part of the uh, part of the ones. And the ones are saying, well, no, because then we'll be tens or we like just having ones and we don't want those other people to come in. And, you know, at the end of the day, we all have to take a self-assessment and say, are we really going out of our way to be inclusive or are we doing things that exclude other people? I had a client, um, no one on this call, but I had a client who we were talking about this idea of leadership and talking about this idea of inclusivity. And the leader basically said, hey, look, you know what? I keep my my politics at home and uh, and I don't bring them into work and I don't want to talk about this stuff. And you know what I do every Friday is I go out with a group of people from work that, that think and believe the same things that I do. And so I asked him, I said, well, you know, being a leader is kind of like being in a fishbowl and everything that you do is observed and seen by other people. So if someone from your office saw you hanging out with these other people that maybe agree with the same things you do, is there a chance they could feel excluded? And I wish you could have seen the face on this guy. He was like, it was like a cartoon bubble. Like, oh my gosh, I'm excluding people. And I didn't even realize it. And that could make people feel that I don't care about. It. And it just goes on and on and on. And so we have to be very careful as leaders about what we're projecting and what we're doing to make things inclusive. And I can't harp on this point um, enough. So the next thing is that diversity, equity, and inclusion leadership takes courage and vulnerability. Brene Brown is literally one of my favorite authors. She's written a bunch of books and she's got some great TED Talks out there, but she did a landmark study of 15,000 leaders across all different industries. And that research showed that there was only one identifiable trait that was common in the top leaders, only one. And that trait was vulnerability. And she always asks this question when she's giving this talk. She says, I want you to think of someone who's done something courageous that did not show vulnerability. And so the short answer is no one's ever been able to answer that question because in order to do something courageous, by definition, you have to take a risk. You have to put yourself out there. You have to take a chance. You have to be willing to go someplace that's uncomfortable. I was giving another talk to a men's group um, right after George Floyd's uh, murder. And I gave the talk similar to this. And at the end of it, one of the guys raised his hand and said, hey, you know what? Um, I agree with everything you're saying, but, you know, people where I'm from, they don't they don't agree with this. And you know what, I've got close friends and family that, that don't agree with this. And I'm afraid that I might lose those relationships. And I said, Hey, you know what, congratulations. 
That's great self-awareness. You, you identified exactly what's limiting you. Congratulations. But let, let me come at it a couple of different ways. So if you think back to that the way I explained it, think back to uh, Mr. Floyd's murder. Um, there were three other officers that that were there um, that could have intervened, but for a lot of reasons chose um, not to. And, you know, it takes a lot of courage to be able to speak up and say something. And quite frankly, if it's not that important to you, you're probably not going to speak up and say something. But if this is if this is important to you, you're going to speak up and say something, because if you don't, you're very much like those three officers that stood by and did nothing. And so I'm bringing this point up because yeah, called it uncomfortable conversations. Yeah, th this is uncomfortable when you're in a conversation and it crosses a line whether it's an ethnic, gender, racial line, it's meant to be humor, but it crosses a line. Do you have the courage to say something? Because as a leader, if you don't, and somebody's observing that, they're going to assume that you are, you are a participant in that. And again, leadership requires that courage, that vulnerability, going that place that is uncomfortable, because you know what? You do that, you might just risk being alienated or ostracized or in some cases, um, even worse. One more story about this that um, happened with a, with a client who's a college football coach, D3, um, not playing football this year, but he's out on the East Coast. And, you know, he was uncomfortable talking to his uh, players about this. And so finally he did. And, you know, after a little bit of coaching, he got to this point where he said, you know what, I want to do this Zoom meeting. I want to have the players on it. I want to put together a panel of players that have played for me or that I played with. He, he played at the same school he coaches now. And uh, you know, I want to do that. So he did it, asked me to facilitate it. And you know, it was just this very powerful, powerful experience. But one of his current players, the one that kind of helped him see things a little bit differently, said something that was so powerful. And we were talking about this idea of vulnerability and putting yourself out there. And he said, you know what, to his teammates, what we do is dangerous. We put on helmets, we put on shoulder pads, we go out there, we try to hurt our opponents. Sometimes in practice, you know, we put our bodies on the line. Sometimes in games, we put our bodies on the line. You know, it, it's dangerous. So I'm not buying that you're uncomfortable having a conversation with me about race. I'm just not buying it. I'm not buying that you don't have the courage to do it because you got the courage to go play football. Don't tell me you don't have the courage to ask me how I'm doing. And that's really the four words. And a lot of my clients, uh, when things started to happen over the summer, a lot of my clients were uncomfortable having these conversations. And what I told all of them is, look, it's four words, four words. How are you doing? And then shut up. Don't say anything, just listen. And if the person's not ready to engage, and let's face it, if you have employees of color in your organization and they saw the George Floyd murdered, even if they aren't people of color and they saw that George, they're probably not doing okay. But if you don't say anything, if you don't engage them, you're creating a void, a vacuum. And whenever you have a vacuum or a void like that, it's going to get filled with something. And what it's going to get filled with is a story that those people of color, those employees are going to be telling themselves about you as a leader, why you didn't say anything. And it's probably not going to be favorable to you. So again, it's simple. Four words. How are you doing? Crucial conversation, some Great training. Book's a little dry. I apologize if the author's on the call, but uh, book's a little dry. But the training is is really, really powerful because it teaches you to not have judgment. It teaches you to start with the facts. Keep the conversation safe. Again, if it's not, if they're not ready to talk, don't force it. Back out and come at it again. Be curious. And you know what? Don't assume um, that you have 
all of the uh, all of the answers because that can become very dangerous. And sometimes, you know, we need to listen more than we talk and just be curious. And that works for all kinds of different issues. So I love this quote by, uh, by Tolstoy. Um, and the reason why I love it is because it challenges our ability to innovate. It challenges our ability to think differently. And so basically what it's saying is, hey, you know what? If you're not very smart, you can understand something complicated if you haven't made up your mind. But if you've made up your mind about something, there's absolutely no chance you're going to understand something simple because you've already made up your mind um, about it. So let's let's see if this works. It worked when I practiced it. Um, so look at this equation. And uh, Sarada, you're the only one I can see. So is there any chance that that equation is true? Is there any way possible that equation is true? It's possible. I What's that? I said, I think it's possible, yes. Okay, how is that true? X plus one equals, 10 plus one equals nine. How's that possible? If X is zero, no, just kidding. <laughs> uh, yeah, it may not, I'm, and I'm in finance, it may not be possible. Okay, well, hey, you know what? If you're looking at it this way, it, it's not possible. But if you turn it upside down, it absolutely is possible. Just by flipping it on its side, or if you got a piece of paper in front of you, you're looking at it from one side. Somebody, thank you for being vulnerable there, Sharada. I appreciate that. Um, but someone else could be looking at it from the other side. You're both looking at the problem. You're both saying, this is right, this is right, this is right. Well, yeah, but we're also saying you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. And that's judgment. If we open up our minds, it's amazing um, what we can find and what we can see. All right. So just a quick story about my buddy, Ab you know what, I'm going to come back to this because I think it's important to talk about uh, diversity. Including. So this is a uh, this is a landmark study that was done back in 2011, and it talks about this idea of diversity and inclusion as a business imperative. And it says a bunch of things, but I'll just summarize it for you. Um, millennials are in the workforce. Gen Xers are in the workforce. Um, and you know what? They've got certain expectations about companies that they work for. They want to work for companies that walk the talk that they want companies that don't just say in their mission, vision, and value statement that they're about their community and about diversity and inclusion. They they want to see the proof in the pudding. And what I love about millennials is that they're not going away. They're, they're stubborn. They're going to push the envelope. They're not going to quit until there's until there's uh, there's decisive um, change. But so here's the thing: if you want to attract employees. Um, how is your employees that are qualified? What is your company doing to cast a net that's wide enough to attract people from all kinds of different backgrounds? You know, if your company was founded in 1950 or before, excuse me, and you're still recruiting from the same schools that you did, in the 1950s and the 1960s, and you're casting the net in the same pond that you did in 1950, you're going to get the same results. But here's the thing, there's just going to be less of them. There's going to be fewer of them available. So it becomes a business imperative if you want to attract that high caliber talent. They're looking for companies that embrace this idea of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So this is the dark side of it about why it's important. And uh, full disclosure, my uh, daughter, who's 27, went to the University of Missouri. My son-in-law went to the University of Missouri. They still live in Columbia, Missouri. All of my tuition dollars for her went to University of Missouri. But the University of Missouri put this ad up, and it was up for about 15 minutes. You can Google it. It's kind of famous in the advertising world about an advertising fail. 
And, you know, if you don't get what's wrong with this, then there's a couple other slides I can show you. But at the end of the day, if someone that had a lens of diversity, of equity, of inclusion, looked at this before it went out, it never would have gone out this way. All you got to do is keep the same, you could, you could move the pictures around and do some other things with it. But this going out like that created a firestorm uh, for the University of Missouri. So again, one another one of the reasons why it's important. So it's good for business because if you want to attract good people, you're going to need to do this. This is the dark side of it. Let me give you um, just a couple of more uh couple more resources. Robert Blackwell um, is the uh, chair of the U.S. Black Participation Task Force. He is a staunch believer in free enterprise. And what his organization does is when people say, hey, look, you know, I can't find qualified people of color. Hey, I can't find vendors of color to do business with. He's a resource that you can go to, and I'll leave this with Sharada so she can uh, put it up on your website to, uh, to help identify uh, those things. Because again, employees, yes, but what about vendors? What, what about suppliers? What about people you choose to do business with? How diverse are they? And, you know, are your clients, your customers, are they demanding that diversity? Again, not because it's something that feels good, although it does, but because it's a business imperative. Here's another organization. So whereas Robert Blackwell's group is all about the free enterprise system and just doing business and that'll raise all, uh, all ships. This is an organization called Be Brave. And I, both, neither of these am I, do I have any affiliation with. Um, as a matter of fact, Be Brave was just referred to me uh, last week by a, by a colleague. But what they do is they work with first generation college students and they provide coaching, they provide internships, they provide mentoring, and they help them not just get through college, but they help them launch their careers. And, you know, again, how innovative can we be? Are we willing to go into colleges and find college sophomores and juniors that maybe want to do an internship with us or with our organization? Could that help the pipeline? Again, if this is something that's important to your organization. I want to go back and just end with my buddy uh, Abner Gannett. I know this is a talk about race, but Abner, unfortunately, we lost him back in 2012, but Abner was a volunteer back when I was a healthcare administrator at the organization um, where I worked. He's a former mayor of Elmhurst and he was, uh, his family owned uh, Leonard's Clothing, if you've ever uh, shopped there. Um, but Abner uh, got me to be a trustee at Elmhurst University. Abner got me in the Rotary Club, got me on the bank board, just became a great friend. And when he'd come in to volunteer with me, it was it was almost like uh, this, it was Tuesdays with Maury or Monday, there's a book, something, I can't remember the name right now, but he'd come in my office, we'd sit down and he would tell me stories about what it was like growing up as a young Jewish kid on the west side of Chicago, getting chased home by bullies because they didn't think that people that looked like him or worshiped the way he did should be allowed to cross through their neighborhood to get home. And, you know, it was just uh, sharing stuff at a very deep, intimate level that, again, just bonded us. We became friends. And if you look at us, um, didn't have a lot in common, you know, different haircuts, different religions, different races. Um, he's about five feet tall. Um, but, you know, we didn't have a lot in common outwardly, but we developed this great friendship. Well, as the story goes, Abner was asked to escort a uh, Nobel Prize winner that came to speak at Elmhurst, now Elmhurst University. Uh, Ellie Wiesel. Ellie Wiesel was on campus. Abner's escorting him. They're walking around. They sit down under a tree on a bench and Ellie Wiesel says to Abner, Abner, what did you uh, do during the war? Abner says, I, I, I can't talk about it. It's too difficult. It's too, uh, it's too hurtful. Ellie Wiesel says, no, please tell me. I'd like to know. So Abner says, all right, you know, I enlisted in the 1st Infantry Division. I fought my way across Europe and my unit liberated the Buchenwald death camp. Ellie Wiesel stops him, grabs his arm and says, Abner, what day was that? 
Abner game the exact day of the week, the day of the month, the time. Ellie Wiesel, I still get chills every time I, I tell this story. Ellie Wiesel says, Abner, you saved my life. I was supposed to be executed the next day. True story. Abner was told by Ellie Wiesel, you have to tell the story. You can't not tell the story. Because if you don't tell the story, the same thing could happen again. So from that point on, Abner made it his mission. And if you remember those old slide carousels with the pitch, the slides in them and spun around, he wheeled that little carousel into middle schools, high schools, civic organizations, churches, synagogues, mosques. And he would give talks about, about his experiences during the war. And, he, and towards the end, I was driving him around to do these. Uh, do these talks, but he would always tell people two things. He would say, you know, beware of man's inhumanity to man and the consequences of being indifferent. Man's inhumanity to man is you see somebody being bullied and you, uh, and you know what, you you just sit there and you, you watch it or you see, you see somebody getting abused verbally and you, and it just never ceased to amaze them how, uh, how cruel people could be to each other. And this consequence of being indifferent is that idea of walking by a bully doing something and not saying something about it. And so Abner was one of my heroes. And I think it's so appropriate to remember those two things today about man's inhumanity to man and the consequences of being indifferent, specifically not doing something about these issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So Sharada, I'll I'll stop right there uh, for now. Well, Wes, I want to just start by saying thank you. I don't want to put words in everyone's mouth, but I think that was a very powerful, uh, powerful talk and really appreciate you sharing with us.